we are continuing our, uh, our series on what on earth am I here for? And I don't know if after last week, a lot of you, if you were here or if you weren't here, um, I really want to encourage you to download Jason's message. It was fantastic. Um, I, I was on the airplane and could watch the first 10 minutes of his sermon and then I had to switch off. Um, but I, I then listened to it when I got back and I thought, my goodness, um, what an incredible message. And if you haven't listened to it, please do yourself a favor so that you can actually follow along with the series. But before we go any further, let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you so much that you are alive, that your word is alive. And that no matter where we go or who we are, there you are. If we seek you, we will find you. And so, Father, I just pray that as we go into the second part of the series, that you will be with me, that my words will be your words, and that you will minister to every single one of us in the way that we need to receive and hear your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So there is a Canadian um, artist and author called Douglas Douglas Coupland who wrote a book um, called Player One. And in the book, he said this, you keep waiting for the moral of your life to become obvious, but it never does. Work, work, work. No moral, no plot, no eureka. Just production schedules and days. You might as well be living inside a photocopier. Your lives are all they're ever going to be. Wow, isn't that an encouraging statement right there, okay? Douglas Coupland is not a Christian, okay, author. Um, But just to show you the type of um, uh, view that people have about life, um, that that is um, the reality that so many people live with, that so many of us live with, that life might as well just be a photocopier because every day is the same and there's no purpose to each day. And um, we really need to be able to answer the question, what on earth am I here for? That's a really important question that we need to be able to answer for ourselves so that we're not just living in a photocopier. And you know what the thing is, is that if that is the view that you have on life, work, 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 I just get up every day and I do the same thing over and over, it doesn't matter how much you have or how much comfort you have or how much wealth you have or how little wealth you have or where you are in your life. It doesn't matter if you have everything or have nothing. If you don't know what the purpose is of your life, you will live a very frustrated life. Because it will just be the same thing every day, not knowing why. So we know who we are. Last week, Jason spoke about the fact that we are not an accident. And I really do believe that. There are no accidents. As he said, there are accidental parents who might not have planned to have that child when they did. But there are no accidental children. I was conceived out of wedlock, and I believe that I am not an accident. Nobody here, nobody online is an accident. And um, maybe you've lost sight of your purpose, or maybe you've never had an idea of what your purpose is. And I'm really trusting God that by the end of the series, we will all be able to at least start answering that question. We'll be able to at least start being honest about who God has made us to be and that he is the one who actually has a purpose for our lives. And God has given every single man and woman a purpose. He really has. He's given every single man and woman a purpose. The key is to discover what it is and then to live it out. You need to discover what your purpose is and then you need to live it out again. You can have the knowledge of what your purpose is, deny it, never live it out, and be frustrated. I remember when I was young, I think I was about 11 years old, um, when Halley's Comet was going to come and do its huge display. Um, That was in the 80s. I don't know if anyone else remembers that. Um, But I think I was about 11 years old, and we went to my uncle's house that lived... um, 
quite far away where, you know, the sky, things were going to be quite dark and we would get a good glimpse of it. So there we were with the best binoculars that, that they could probably have back then and like watching to see Halley's Comet. And I remember like thinking, oh, okay, you know, like that's it. All right, because there was this little light flickering through this expansive sky, and I could only see that little light by looking through a pair of binoculars. And then you have to ask yourself the question, why? Why couldn't Halley's Comet be right in front of us to experience? Well, obviously we would die, but like, you know, why, why not? And in Colossians 1 verse 16, it says, all things were created in him. He created everything in heaven and on earth. He created everything that can be seen and everything that can't be seen. He created kings, powers, rulers, and authorities. That's um, on earth and in the, in the spiritual realm. And then it says, all things have been created by him and for him. Now, that's a very important part of the verse. That's why I've highlighted it. All things have been created by him and for him. All creation, everything that exists, was made by God and for God. Think about this. What portion of the universe do we actually get to see as human beings? Very little. We get to see very little. We have the most amazing telescopes that have been created today. When I googled it, the largest telescope I think is on the Canary Islands. And, you know, when I googled what pictures does, does again, it was pictures that really my kid could have drawn when they were little, okay? So what I'm trying to say is, is that we don't get to see nearly even a tiny pinprick of what is actually out there. And so, as Colossians 1 verse 16 says, all things were created by him and for him. Now, we've probably seen beautiful pictures of galaxies, of faraway stars, of comets. We've seen what is out there because of these telescopes. But um, when we ask ourselves the very honest question, okay, but then who are they for? Who are the stars for? Who are the galaxies for? Who are the comets for? Well, they're not for us because we can't appreciate them. If you can't see it, you can't appreciate it, right? I mean, we know it's there and we can appreciate the expansiveness of the universe because we know it exists because now we get to see a little bit more and more into outer space. But there are parts of outer space that we will never get to experience. The answer is that they're for God. He didn't make them for us. He made them for his own pleasure. He made them for his own pleasure. Does it shock you to think that they are actually parts of the universe that were not created for your and my benefit? I, it's, it's, it's quite surprising to think, oh, so there's actually parts of the universe that I don't get to benefit from. Okay. How about the marine life in the deepest parts of the sea that we will never get to see or get to experience? Who was that made for? It was made for God, it was made by God, for God. And so it's not necessary that we'll never get to see them. They were made for God's own pleasure. Revelations 4 verse 11 says, For you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. You created all things because you created what you pleased. And so were we. We were created, just like everything else, to bring God pleasure. Now, when I say that we were created to bring God pleasure, I don't mean like a toy or a pet brings you pleasure, okay? It's more similar to how our children can bring us pleasure. Now, obviously, it is nowhere along the same lines because, um, you know, we're not God, <laughs> okay, obviously. But think about it. Our children bring us pleasure, but they can also hurt us. They can also disappoint us. They can also 
fail, they can not do what we hoped the best for them. That is how God is viewing us. We are his children. We can disappoint him. We cannot bring him pleasure. But he created us to bring him pleasure. And so the um, very first purpose that we're going to look into today is the fact that we were planned for God's pleasure. So last week we did the introduction, you're not an accident. This week it is that we were planned, you were planned for God's pleasure. You were planned for God's pleasure. And um, I think what happens is that when we think, okay, I was planned for God's pleasure, does that mean that whatever God has for me will never bring me pleasure, will never bring me joy? No, that's not the case, all right? If we focus on God, if we focus on his purpose for our lives, and we live out who he has called us to be, we will experience the most joy ever because then we are truly being who he's created us to be. But we have to focus on God. We have to find out what his purpose is. What did he create us for? If we are meant to bring him pleasure, what does that look like? The thing is, is that if you're on a journey and you decide you want to go down the N2 and experience the garden route, but you start heading up the N1 and you are heading in the wrong direction, no matter how far you drive or how fast you go, you will never get to your desired destination. And so it's the same with God. If we don't focus on God, if we don't focus on what his purpose is, if we keep focusing on ourselves and looking within we can think we are on the right journey. We can think we're on the right path and we can keep going and we can keep going as fast as we think that, that, that we need to go, but we will never reach the destination that he has planned for us. We will never experience the journey en route that he has planned for us. We were created by God and we exist to honor and worship him. Psalm 149 verse 4a says, for the Lord takes pleasure in his people. I mean, think about it. The creator of the universe takes pleasure in you. The creator of the universe takes pleasure. He actually wants to see you fulfill your purpose and take pleasure in you. You were planned for God's pleasure. Like Jason said last week, you're not an accident. And God did not need to create you, but he chose to create you. You exist for his benefit, his glory, his purpose, and his delight. Bringing enjoyment to God, living for his pleasure, is the first purpose of your life. And you know what? When you fully understand that, when you fully understand that truth, that you were created for his pleasure, that he has a purpose for your life, you will never have a problem feeling insignificant. You will never have a problem feeling um, irrelevant or feeling unimportant or feeling unloved ever again. Because what it does is it proves your worth. When you understand that, it proves your worth. Just think about it. If you are that important to God, that he considers you valuable enough, that he created you so that he can spend eternity with you. Don't you see the value in that? Then you must be really valuable. That he created the world and then he created you to take pleasure and delight in you. Then we are really valuable because he wants to spend eternity with us. In Ephesians 1 verse 4 to 5, it says that even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Before I go any further, please carefully look at that first part of the sentence. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us. God didn't make the world and then decide he wanted people. He decided about us before he even made the world. So I think he made the world 
so that the earth, so that we could be in it, so that he could have relationship with us. He's a relationship God. He's not a God who likes to be alone in a room, not connecting with people. He's relational. So he actually thought about us before he even created the world. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Wow. How many years later are you and I on the earth, but he thought about us before he even created the earth, and we bring him great pleasure if we were created to bring pleasure to God, then how do we do that, okay? Bringing pleasure to God is called worship, okay? So the question I want to ask you is, do you know that you were made, that you were created to worship? Every single one of us have something inside of us that was created to worship. But ask yourself the question, what do you really worship? Or who do you really worship? Do you worship your favorite sports teams? Do you worship a band? Do you worship a pop star? Do you worship um, your spouse? Do you worship your um, boyfriend or girlfriend? Do you worship your career? Do you worship money? Do you worship um, your children? Do you worship your goals? Do you adore and revere your dreams and what you and, and the things? Do you adore and revere those things? That's an important question to ask. And we all do, to a certain degree, choose to revere and adore, at times, things over God. But we were made to worship. But we were made to revere and adore the one who created us for his pleasure. That's who we were made to revere and adore. So what does this worship look like? Firstly, worship is far more than music. So I know when I say worship for a lot of us, that is um, coming to church on time so that we get our 15 minutes of worship in, that hopefully the band is on point and they do it really well so that we feel good because, they play, because this morning they did songs that we enjoy. That's what we assume worship is. But that is not what worship is at all. Do you know that the 15 minutes of music that we do as we start is music with Christian lyrics? Because you can play any music and add any lyrics to it. It's music. Now, music was created by God. He loves it when we sing to him. But to use the word worship in that context is actually incorrect. Worship is so much more than just singing in church. Worship is so much more than just putting your, um, your worship music, your, your Christian music, whatever you want to call it, on in the car. Let's not like be, you know, super religious now and say, oh, we can never call it worship music again, okay? That's what we're used to. That's what we call it. But that's not all worship is. Worship is so much more than that. And I can't even read what I've written here, but I'm going to try. Everything you do that brings pleasure to God is an act of worship. Everything that you do that brings pleasure to God. Please notice that part. In other words, everything that you do that is sin is not going to bring pleasure to God. Everything that you do that is not in His will is not going to bring pleasure to God. But everything that you do that brings pleasure to God is an act of worship. Worship is not for your benefit. So when we come to church, there are songs that Jason will be honest with Sam and Erwin and say, that's not my favorite, but I will surrender. <laughs> because I know it's not about me. And that's the point you have to get to. Because remember that no one church is wrong in how they sing their music in their services. It's all about personality and what you prefer. There's no right or wrong. There's just Christian music. What's more important is what you do that brings pleasure to God. Your, what you do is, is going to be an act of worship to God. 
in Isaiah 29, God objected to the worship that was half-hearted and hypocritical. The people were offering God stale prayers, insincere prayers. Thank you, Jesus, praise your name. You know, like just, like, do you even know what you're singing sometimes? You know, that's it. Like sometimes I've been through seasons of my life where in that moment, in that song, I can't sing that line because I know I'm being insincere. And I'd rather deal with that between me and God in the week and say, God, why can't I sing that? What's happening? What's going on inside of me that I'm struggling to sing that line? Because I'm human. And there are times where I'm not connecting with the words that are on the screen. And so this is what was happening um, in the Old Testament. Um, God was upset with the stale prayers, the insincere prayers, the empty words, and the man-made rituals. So much of what we do is like ticking a box, right? But have we ever thought about why we do it? Is it actually in the Bible? Did Jesus tell us that we need to do that? So there are rituals that are man-made, but God's heart is not touched by tradition. He's, he's, tradition is fine if it's sincere, but his heart isn't touched by it. But his heart is touched by passion, and commitment by the heart attitude. This is what he said in Isaiah 29 verse 13. The Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. And so worship cannot just be a part of your life. Worship, it is your life. Worship is is your 24 hours, seven days a week. If pleasing God is the first purpose of our lives, but, we are, but, but we're being honest with ourselves and we know that maybe that's not the case, you know, God, honestly, I can say that maybe my life isn't completely worshiping you, then how do we change it? Mark 12 verse 30 says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the three points that I want to leave with you today is that God desires our attention, God desires our affection, and God desires our action. I'll try to make it really easy, okay? Attention, affection, and action. So first of all, attention. You know what it's like if you're having a conversation with, with, with someone, and we're all guilty of this, and they are deep in conversation and you are not present, right? You've, everyone has, has experienced that? That person is talking, but you're aware of that conversation going on there, what that person's doing there, what you're having for lunch later on, what's happening, and then they ask you a question and you're like, Sorry? Anyone been caught in that situation? Okay, one honest person in the room. Thank you, Carmen. Okay, hallelujah, praise the Lord. So the, the fact is, is that we can all get caught in having our attention um, distracted. We can get distracted. And we need to keep our minds on God because let's be honest, just as we get distracted in conversation, we get distracted in our day-to-day -day away from God. Distractions take us away from God. And how we can give him our attention is to cultivate an awareness of his presence in our day-to-day. -day. We actually need to cultivate it. We need to, be, we, we, we need to be intentional to say, okay, God, I'm going to cultivate an awareness of your presence in my work, in this meeting, with my children, driving to work, cooking dinner. I'm going to cultivate an awareness of your presence because I want to be... I want to give you my attention. I want to worship you with my attention. I want my mind to be set on you. Then affection. Affection are our emotions. It's what comes from our heart and our soul, okay? Now, there are times when we struggle to keep God in his rightful place in our hearts. And how does this happen? Think about what you love, what we have, affection towards. It affects how we spend our money, how we manage our relationships, what we dream about, what we work for, 
and how we spend our time. In other words, the affection of our hearts sets the direction of our lives. So remember earlier on I asked you, what do you worship? The affection of your heart sets the direction of your lives. And that's huge because nobody wants to get to the end of their life and realize that all they did was chase shallow and empty idols. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants to lie on their deathbed and say, well, at least I followed that pop star and believed everything that they said. Or at least I worked 80 hours a week and never saw my family. Nobody gets to the end of their lives and that's what they are happy about, okay? We need to give God our affection. And so since worship involves taking pleasure in God, it involves your emotions. Something that gives you pleasure is taking from your emotions, right? You can't get pleasure out of something and be unemotional about it. So um, worshiping God involves our emotions. And God gave you emotions so that you could worship him. That's why you have emotions. But our emotions need to be genuine. They need to be sincere and not be fake. So it's all very well to say, oh, okay, Sue, okay, I get it. So I must really put on a show. I must really make sure that everybody thinks that I'm so into God. No, it's in the quiet, in the dark, where no one is looking. It's what is in your heart that God cares about. And the truth is, is that you choose how far or how close you are to God. It's in the private that you choose how far or how close. And then lastly, actions. We worship God by giving him our actions, by living in obedience to his commandments, by using our abilities, our talents to honor him, to glorify him. It doesn't matter what you do. You could be a teacher, you could be a nurse, you could be an accountant, you could be a pastor, you could be a mechanic, you could be a stay-at-home mom, a stay-at-home dad. It doesn't matter what you do, it's who you're doing it for. Remember, he created you to bring him pleasure. It's who you're doing it for. So, when you know who you're doing it for, then you want to be obedient in everything that he says and everything that he expects of you. And so what we often do is we actually offer God partial obedience. Do you know what partial obedience is? I'm going to pick and choose which of the Ten Commandments I like. And if I don't like four out of six, God, I'm not going to follow those, okay? Because I only want partial obedience. But do you know what partial obedience is? Uh, obedience? It's disobedience. Partial obedience is disobedience. You, there's no such thing as partial obedience. It's, it's disobedience. And so total obedience is when you give your whole heart to God and you do it with joy and excitement. And um, James actually encouraged Christians in um, the book of James where he said that we please God by what we do and not only by what we believe. It's not just about what you believe. It's actually being obedient. And you know what? I think so often people think, okay, I know what. I'm going to wait for that day when God reveals the great thing I'm going to do for him the great and wonderful mighty thing, then I will be obedient. But do you know what brings God pleasure? It's obedience in the small, everyday decisions, everyday actions, everyday things that you do. That is what brings God pleasure. Something great, amazing, might come once in your lifetime. And God will be pleased if you're obedient to that. But what got Jesus to start his ministry at 30 was the daily obedience of who he was up until that point. And then God only kept him on earth for a short while. The daily small obedience. What do you need to sit down with God and talk about where you know, you know what? I'm being partially obedient. I come to church but I don't do this. I read my Bible, but I don't want to forgive those who hurt me. It's either 
obedience or disobedience. You, it's your choice. In 1 Samuel 15 verse 22, Samuel said, What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Everything that you do is worship. Everything that you do. And many years ago, Matt Redman a uh, worship pastor in, in England, um, their church, his pastor decided that they were going off track as to what worship was. And so he stopped all music in their church, like completely. And they would come to church and he tried to teach them what it was to worship God without music and in their day-to-day -day lives. And through that period of having just absolutely complete surrender to, to having no music in church and having to almost relook at what it meant to worship God, Matt Redman wrote the song that if you've been in church for many years, you know the heart of worship. And the part that I love is it says, I'll bring you more than a song because the song in itself is not what you've required. In other words, God isn't requiring the song. He wants us to bring more than a song. You search much deeper within than the way things appear. You're looking into my heart because the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. In other words, the crux, the central issue of your heart is what matters. And Miles Monroe said, the greatest tragedy in life is not death, but a life without purpose. And so will you close your eyes and just let God minister to you right now. Just while we're in this attitude of worship, I want to encourage you this morning, whether you're here in person or online, to recommit to realizing that you were created for God's pleasure. To recommit to finding out how you need to give God your attention, your affection, and your actions by being obedient to His Word in the small everyday things. What does that look like? How do you come back to the heart of worship? How do you make it all about Him? How do you make it more than a song? Because a song in itself is not what he required, but he requires the crux of your heart to be in submission to him, to surrender to him, to bring him pleasure. Because what he has called you to, the purpose that he has for you, that will be the best experience of your life. If you surrender yourself to him, and you seek His purpose. What on earth are you here for? Start by worshiping Him in your everyday life. And as we close off with, with uh, one more uh, chorus, can I just encourage you that if you have never made a decision ever to follow Jesus, to surrender your life to Him, or maybe you have and you have fallen away. We want to give you an opportunity today to make a decision to follow Him, to commit to giving Him your attention, your affection, and your actions. And there will be people in the Connect area that you can go and speak to who will pray with you, who will stand with you, who will give you material to help you on your journey. And so let's just stand together as we just, with these words, if you mean them, just make the commitment that I just prayed.